Okay, uh, welcome Crown Council members and others to this uh, webinar series. We're so grateful that you would join us, whether live or on recording. Um, we're thankful to have One Capital Management with us. Uh, this, just as a reminder, uh, this webinar is gonna be recorded so we can watch it at another time or you can go back and listen to it anytime you want um, and it'll be posted to the Crown Council website. I know that oftentimes uh, there's background noise from other people's phones. So if, if you're not talking or asking questions, I just ask you to mute yourself. Um, so if, if you're not muting yourself and weird things are going on in your background, I'll just mute you anyway. So, uh, <laughs> but we're grateful to have everyone join us. Um, we're excited to introduce One Capital as a new resource partner. They are a premier uh, boutique investment advisory firm that oversees roughly $2 billion in assets, and they're located in Westlake Village, California. Uh, two of their senior partners are with us today, Gary Dorfman and Eric Hamill. And uh, yes, Gary is Dr. Bill Dorfman's brother. He's also his uh, financial advisor. And uh, <laughs> I thought this was fun, but um, Bill can create great dentistry, but it's Gary who has ensured his financial plan and investment strategy that's worthy of all the beautiful smiles that he creates. And uh, Gary brings over 30 years of investment management experience and has worked with some of the biggest premier firms in Wall Street. Uh, an innovator in financial service industry, creating wealth management platforms for several large financial institutions. And he's also had a significant experience working with dentists in the country uh, and at one time managed a large pool th through Kane Waters. Gary and his team have created an educational webinar series. So this is the first of five, and it's designed specifically for Crown Council, which is uh, fantastic as our, our resource partners are becoming more and more involved with us. Uh, in this first webinar, Gary and Eric will be discussing some of the important keys to successful planning and investing during these unprecedented times. So we're grateful to have um, Gary and Eric with us, and I'll turn the time over to them and, uh, and let it roll. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Stu. Um, really appreciate being here. Uh, exciting for us to uh, be resource partners, of course. Um, I've known about Crown Council for over 20 years, just hearing about what an incredible organization it is from, uh, you know, from my big brother. And so um, now for us to have an opportunity to to be a part of it um, is something that we're, um, as a firm and me personally, um, extremely excited about. Um, well, this has certainly been an incredible time uh, for all of us. Uh, I know how much uh, the global pandemic and the coronavirus has impacted um, all of our lives and sort of turned it upside down. I think nowhere is that more apparent um, as well um, is in the financial markets. Um, as I'm sure most of you have observed, um, it's been quite a roller coaster ride indeed. Um, since the virus hit in sort of mid February, um, the market uh, reacted uh, pretty significantly from a volatility perspective. Um, it was down almost 35% in relatively a short period of time, um, bottomed out uh, in, on March 23rd, and then through an aggressive um, and accommodative uh, Federal Reserve policy, which has been incredibly stimulating to um, the economy, uh, the markets rebounded um, incredibly uh, based on everything that's going on in the world, almost 50% since the market bottom on March 23rd. And so in the 30 years that I've been working on Wall Street and in financial markets, I've never seen such a dramatic disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. And so I think that uh, in this environment, with all the instability and uncertainty, we thought it was especially timely that we shared what we think are some of the most important keys to success in how you should be thinking about um, investing, it's not me, uh, investing your portfolio, planning for the future. Um, so I have my partner here, Eric Hamill, who has an uh, incredible background on the planning part. So we're both gonna share some of these key concepts, um, which is outlined on this, uh, on this first slide. The first really deals with planning, and as I'm sure you know, and 
the great work that you do through the Crown Council, planning is the key to long-term success. And not only with your business, but certainly with your finances. So thinking about how you create the right plan uh, specific, specifically for you, we're all different. We all have unique needs and circumstances that we're trying to accomplish. And so creating the right plan um, is one of the most critically um, important components of financial success. Um, a lot of people talk about asset allocation. What is it? What's it mean? Asset location. These are really important co uh, concepts as it relates to um, creating the right investment plan. Um, as Eric will talk about, asset allocation has such an important impact on how you're going to be able to achieve your long-term financial goals. Probably one of the greatest um, misunderstood areas in investing, and we wanted to touch on it a little bit, is the ability to time the markets. I probably get asked, especially in this environment, um, several times a week is when's the best time to get in the market? Um, you know, do you think the market is at its all time high? Um, you know, how should I think about timing my investing? And as you will see in the information that we'll share, uh, market timing is a very difficult uh, thing to actually be successful in doing. And so going back to the plan is what's most critically important. Um, many people have been confused by the different type of investment approaches and um, philosophies in how to actually manage your investment portfolios once you have created a plan, what that implementation looks like. So we wanted to spend a little time on the different type of investment approaches and what might work best for you. And then finally, um, the last point that we wanted to cover in the keys to success is understanding the structure. If you're working with an advisor currently, understanding their structure, what their role is, um, how they're compensated, um, how they're you know, ultimately um, structured to provide you the right type of advice. We call it the fiduciary difference um, is also a really important component of achieving financial success. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to uh, my partner, uh, Eric Hamill. Um, Eric has been in the uh, financial services industry for close to 20 years. Um, he's a CFP, CLU, AEP. <laughs> he's got a ton of letters after his name, sort of an alphabet suit of letters. But uh, essentially what that means is he's incredibly um, deep um, and uh, an, a real expert in the area of planning and tax, which is an important component of obviously um, achieving your financial goals and objectives and, and one of the real important keys to success. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric. Eric. Thanks, Gary. Welcome, everybody. So we'll start off with this quote because I think it's very appropriate. What's the use of running if you're not on the right road? Well, this year, many people have found themselves, unfortunately, on the wrong road. And whether it's a pothole in some cases, this year might seem more like a crater in some situations. So how can you avoid running on the wrong road? As Gary alluded to, we believe that to be planning. And especially this year, but even in any typical year that we all have business operations and we're investing in the markets, what we find is number one, the lack of a plan, right? That's the more common of the two. And the second being not a truly deep, meaningful and thoughtful plan. So sometimes when financial plans are done, sometimes they're more of a selling mechanism for a financial product, for example. So how is it that you can determine that you're on the right road? Do you have the right type of plan in place? So I learned a long time ago that this is what it boils down to. My mentor in this business early on in my career, you know, back on the East Coast, he's been doing this for over 50 years. And we worked with surgeons, we worked with dentists, we worked with um, owners of sports rehab centers, and a, a, just a wonderful group of clientele, including also some Fortune 100 CEOs. It's a very unique practice. And I asked him one day, how is it that you separated yourself so much from your peers? And we get to work with the clientele that we do. And he kind of smiled and looked at me and he goes, it's easy, Eric. It's just three-dimensional chess. That's it. And I kind of laughed and I said, what are you talking about? That sounds complicated. He said, well, it is. But he actually got that from Star Trek. And that kind of always stuck with me to this day. Apparently there was an episode where Spock was playing three-dimensional chess. And that's the way I've ever since then thought about this business. And so these are what we've identified to be kind of the six pillars of any truly meaningful financial plan. Today, we're obviously focusing on the investment side. 
But we will touch on one or two of the tax pieces because if you do a great job on the investing and not a great job on the tax side in your plan, it's not all for naught, but you're leaving a lot on the table. Beyond that cash flow, as you know with your business, of course, that's crucial. It's how it's eventually valued if you were to sell it or pass it on, how stocks and bonds are valued, how we live our lives, and insurance. You know, everyone's favorite subject, right? You don't want to be overinsured, underinsured. There's so many pitfalls in the world of insurance, and that's some of the letters after the name why I got them, and the estate and legal side. So while we're not going to go through all of these today, we wanted to point out that these are all the areas that should be addressed in a truly meaningful plan and a coordinated effort across the board with your other advisors. Whether you already have estate planning attorneys, CPAs, often we find this is operating in a silo. So the last part on this list, and it's not least, is personal preference. You want to use that obviously across the board. We may have two people with the same situation on paper, but they're two different people. They may have two different beliefs. They may have two different philosophies of how they want to live their lives. One's not right or wrong. You need to take that into consideration for a meaningful plan. So use that to kind of set the stage here as normally when you talk about financial planning, this is what you're going to see, right? You're going to see something about, hey, we want to, you want to grow your assets. You want to beat inflation. You want to create an income for retirement, maybe education for kids or grandkids passing on to the next generation. And those are all well and good, but it really comes down to the why. And how can you differentiate, especially in a market like this? Well, in our opinion, that starts here. In our industry, and if you've been investing for any period of time, you've probably heard the word allocation maybe a thousand times. And a lot of times it gets lost in translation. What does it even mean and what should you be doing as a result? You'll see right here, and this is well healed. If anyone's really interested, we can give you all kinds of data behind this. There's many, many studies on this for decade after decade. The bulk of what you earn from your portfolio really comes down to how you're allocated across the different parts of the market and for how long. Now, we are money managers, and we're here telling you 5% of the long term is actually the stock or security selection itself. The example I like to give is, say you were the one investing in Google versus Yahoo. Most people would say, well, that's obviously the better choice of the two. Wouldn't that make a big difference? And the answer is, of course. However, most people don't have just one stock. Most people have a portfolio of holdings. So if that was your one stock, but in the wrong industry, oil and gas maybe this year, right? There's travel and leisure, what, what have you. It's what areas of the market you have the exposure to over what period of time. So if we know that to be true, we believe that your planning should dictate that asset allocation. If you do a thoughtful plan and you need to earn 6% to maintain your lifestyle, don't shoot for 30%. That can send you backwards. On the same side, if you need to earn 6%, don't be so conservative that you're only gonna make four. You want the planning to drive the bus. You want the planning to help you design that asset allocation so you're much more likely to not only stick with it, but see the results that you should. This year is a great example of the financial curtain being pulled back and people unfortunately seeing that they were on that wrong road that we were talking about before. So I'm only gonna spend a minute on this slide. Don't worry, I know there's a lot going on here. It just showcases the point. From left to right, from year 2000 to 2019, the top line is the highest performing asset class that year, and the bottom line is the lowest performing asset class that year. Can anybody see the pattern? The answer is, I hope not. Unless you stare at it long enough, you might actually try and convince yourself that there is a pattern. And that's often what we find. It's human nature. We want to see, we want to look to history as a guide, and we want to say, well, because of this, then that. And in the world that we work in, that is where Gary was referring to before. When you try and time some of these things, you can just be very dead wrong in that approach. So again, if that's kind of the foundation that we're starting on, this is a quote that I think really brings it all home. You cannot control the market. You cannot control tax law. But what you can control is how you use the accounts that offer you the right advantages. And those good decisions can make a massive difference. You know, Vice President of Investment and Tax Solutions at Fidelity, you know, he's probably got some experience in this. In the way I think of it, it's a lot easier to save yourself 40 or 50% in taxes than it is to make 40 or 50% in the marketplace. Focus on what you can control. As much as Gary and I would like to say we're, we're great in this industry, we still can't predict the future, as many people try to do. 
we're not gonna sit here and say we're gonna time the market. So what is it you should be doing? This is something that we very, very often see being missed. This is where I'm gonna spend the balance of my time here today. I'm gonna to start with an explanation, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Think of that as person A on the left and person B on the right. Person A on the left, most of the time when we get referred somebody, they do not even have all three buckets here. Any of us on this call, if you're investing in the United States of America, only have three categories of assets that you can own. Every single thing you own has to fit into one of these categories. No matter what it is, your practice, cash in the bank, your real estate, your portfolio assets, retirement account, whatever you have in this world has to fit in one of those three buckets. What we often find is most people don't even have all three buckets being utilized. So that's one mistake that we see very, very frequently across the board. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on that today. We'll cover that in parts of the other web webinars, but suffice it to say, you sh almost everybody, 99 plus percent of people should be using all three of these buckets. And if someone's told you you can't, it's probably wrong. So assuming someone even is using two or three of these buckets, what we then typically see is they have the same portfolio mirrored in every different type of account. That is very inefficient from a portfolio management perspective and even worse on the tax side. And this is not a perfect example. This is just to kind of illustrate the point. We're not suggesting that everyone should do exactly what's showing on the right hand side, but let me illustrate the point here. Say person A and person B this year make 10% in the market by the time this is all said and done. Okay, the market is up overall from where it started this year. So the person on the left is earning 10. If they only have one bucket, they're only earning that 10 in that tax type of an account. So if you're a dentist and say maybe you're 40% between state and federal taxes, you make 10, you keep six, right? Just to oversimplify it. Well, the person on the right, person B says, I wanna be a lot more thoughtful about how I invest. I know that my 10% average doesn't mean everything I own earn 10%. I have some stock that's done wonderful this year, Zoom like we're all on, right? Well, in that case, I wanna take those highest potentially performing assets, put them in my tax-free account. Then I'm gonna take my lowest performing potential assets, my safety assets, or my tax inefficient assets, maybe I put them into my IRA, my 401k. And then for other purposes, the other assets go in the middle to allow for things like tax loss harvesting and gain harvesting, which we'll touch on here, but even go deeper on in another web, web series. Well, what happens as a result of that? They both own the exact same investments, but person B is earning the bulk of that return in their tax-free account. So out of that 10% they're both earning, they might keep eight or 9% based on that theory. So person A again, same 10%, they keep six. Person B, they make 10, they keep eight or nine. What does it allow people to do with their portfolios or in retirement? Number one, they can simply just make more money net bottom line, which is really all that matters, right? Is the bottom line. Number two, and my favorite in retirement especially, they could take less risk and accomplish the same bottom line. Again, same exact investments, just where they're physically located. That's what we call asset location. So if we know allocation is only part of the equation, well then where do you put those assets? So I'm gonna pause there because there's a lot kind of going on in the slide. I'm glad to come back to this in the Q&A because there's a lot here. Know that we're gonna cover more on the, the tax strategy side in a future webinar. So with that, kick it back to Gary. Thank you, uh, Eric. That was a, uh, I think a great overview on some of the uh, key components um, that we should be thinking about and certainly uh, evaluating with your advisors as it relates to planning and uh, creating the right plan. And um, that is something that we are focused on all the time with our clients. Um, and the level of customization um, that goes into that, I think is also very important. Um, everybody's unique. Everybody has their own uh, goals and objectives and concerns. And that's that personal preference um, that Eric was talking about. And we spend a significant amount of time with our clients to really understand what's the most important um, components and issues from them. So I'd mentioned um, at the onset that um, market timing 
is one of the um, sort of misunderstood um, concepts in, in, in investing. And um, so I wanted to spend a little time um, and share some perspective because especially in this market, uh, it's, it's a, a question that we get all the time. And can we time the markets? And I think that this quote by Emerson does a good job of sort of capturing our perspective on market timing. Um, essentially to time the markets to determine when to be in, when to be out, and when to be back in again is almost impossible to do and takes a bit of luck. Um, we don't wanna rely on luck when we're investing for our clients and developing the right investment plan and investment strategy. So we have a much more uh, thoughtful approach and perspective. And as Eric indicated, it all comes down to asset allocation and your investment plan. And that's the determining factor, how we think about um, investing uh, in the equity markets. But just to share with you um, some of the research that's been done on market timing that really confirms, if you will, um, how difficult it is um, to time the markets. Um, on this slide, what you'll see is the S&P 500 and the returns um, in the S&P 500 over a 49 year period from 1970 to 2019. So most recently, um, it shows the growth of $100,000. And what you'll see is on the very far left hand side, if you invested $100,000 in 1970 and you stayed fully invested, you didn't try to move in and out of the markets, uh, your portfolio, that $100,000 would have grown to $3.4 million and the average total return over that 49 year period um, would have been 7.3%. Conversely, if you look at the bar, the third bar to the right, um, and you were out of the market just the, and missed the best 15 days over this 49 year period, um, your returns would have been down almost 30% to 5.2% and your portfolio, the 100,000 only grew to 1.3 versus uh, the 3.4. So three times more you would have had if you stayed uh, fully invested. Uh, the reality is, is that when you look at the historical returns of, of, of the stock market, the returns come in big lumps and spurts at unpredictable times. Um, there's another really interesting research piece um, that, I, um, that I was looking at recently that I think really captures this as well and, and, and is certainly, um, you know, timely from uh, the perspective of you know, the global pandemic and the crisis uh, period that we're in. Um, since, um, the, since World War II, there's been 19 different crisis periods. So whether you're talking about 9-11 or the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Iraqi War, in those 19 different periods, the market was down the first um, 12 months of those period, on average about 11 or 12%. Um, so significant downturn in the market. However, the next 12 months, the market in every one of those 19 periods since World War II, the market was up on average about 20%. So again, it really confirms the fact that you should stay fully invested in the equity portion of your portfolio. Um, for me, I guess the most uh, confirming um, uh, part of this all is um, one of our great investors of all time who I follow very closely is Warren Buffett, as many of you know, and I've heard about Buffett and his approach to investing. And so when Warren is asked what he thinks about market timing or what he thinks the market is going to do, um, he just pauses, kind of smiles the way he does. And he says, I have no idea, nor do I really care. What we focus on is buying great companies and great businesses that we want to own for a very long period of time. So from our perspective, we think uh, seriously about how we want to structure our portfolios and where we want to be in the market. And there certainly is some tactical shifts at times that we can consider, but we firmly believe that, you know, nobody has that illustrious or mystical uh, crystal ball and that with the equity portion of your portfolio, you should stay fully invested. 
So another one of the important components of creating the right plan for you and being a successful investor is highlighted on this next slide. Um, and what is the right investment approach? And um, I'll just say up front that there is no one right investment approach. It really depends on you. Um, and again, what you're trying to accomplish and what you feel comfortable with. And you know, for many years in, in working with individuals and institutions, I've learned that there's, um, there's sort of the fundamental side of investing, uh, historically looking at you know, returns and looking at how asset classes work together. And then there's also the emotional side of investing. What makes you feel the most comfortable when you go to sleep at night? And so if, if your advisor and if we had the opportunity to work together is really doing a thoughtful job for you, they're thinking about those issues and what you feel most comfortable with. So the two most prominent approaches to investing are highlighted here, active portfolio management and passive investing. So, and then we're showing the pros and cons, as you can see. Active is really a research-based driven approach um, focused on portfolio managers that are using some type of fundamental analysis to determine what individual securities, whether they be stocks, large cap, small cap, international, or bonds that they want to own in the portfolio. Um, the benefits of an actively managed approach is it's more customized to your particular situation. There's some tax management capabilities um, that could be um, utilized in an actively managed portfolio. But from my perspective, because most of our clients have already, you know, sort of on their way of creating, you know, a nice estate or portfolio, um, preservation of capital is always a very important component for us. And so through active management, you're able to identify some uh, portfolio managers that have performed exceptionally well during difficult times and have an investment strategy that's or orientated to capital preservation. I guess one of the cons or negatives is it's a little bit higher cost because you're paying um, you know, for, um, for active management and sometimes it won't perform in line with whatever the given index is that you're trying to uh, perhaps mirror. Uh, passive management, as you see on the bottom, um, is really designed to replicate a given um, index. Um, so for example, the S&P 500. And when you're, when you're utilizing passive management, there's no research that goes into it. And essentially your portfolio is gonna move up with the index and down with the index. But from a cost perspective, it's, it's very cost effective. So typically what we look to do is use some combination of active and passive, again, depending on what you're trying to accomplish um, with your financial assets. Um, we lean a little bit more to the active side and I think that this next slide gives you an indication of the difference and the dilemma with um, investing in passive or a given index. So what this slide shows is um, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which um, came out and was published by Mr. Dow and Mr. Jones. And they wanted to have a great way to sort of follow what the market was doing and looking at the leading companies in the, in, in the 12 lar largest sectors in the US economy. Um, this index was actually created in 1896. So this is a over a hundred year period, right? But look at how dramatically the index has changed from the original 12 companies in the Dow Jones, which is illustrated on the left-hand side of the chart to the 30 companies that now represent the Dow Jones industrial average today. Um, as you can see, there's actually no company that um, was in the original Dow Jones um, that's in the 30 Dow Jones uh, stocks today. And so there's a tremendous amount of change that has taken place in the portfolio if you were to say own this index, but there's really no research component um, that went into it. So that's, that's one of the real sort of trade-offs and I think, um, you know, negatives of, um, of just investing only in passive and index type of portfolio strategies. And then I think this, uh, this final slide um, on this whole concept of what is the right investment approach uh, does a really nice job of illustrating the difference of what research means. And so this is looking at specifically now 
during this time period, um, the global pandemic, the coronavirus, um, it's pretty intuitive to think, right, that JCPenney um, hasn't performed well. Um, retail has been hit significantly during this, um, during, you know, the economic downturn that um, Corona has brought, um, you know, really and spread, uh, you know, across the world. Um, and then companies like Zoom, which we're on now, have performed exceptionally well. What research does is it determines which individual securities are most attractive based on fundamental analysis. And so, for example, here at One Capital, we have a whole research team that looks at markets and looks at where there's opportunities that we could take uh, advantage of and benefit for our clients. So um, the one success story that we're gonna share here, and it's just an example, is a company called Pag Segura. Now, most people haven't heard of Pag Segura. I certainly hadn't, uh, but this is what research does. It uncovers opportunities. And so when you look at, uh, this is a company out of Brazil. They're a financial technology company, so they do e-commerce. Brazil is one of the emerging growth companies and really hasn't had much of a, a presence in e-commerce. E-commerce e e is going to you know, dominate how we think about and how we exchange um, you know, financially um, going forward into the 21st, 22nd century. And so this is a company that our research team was able to identify. It has no reflection on the Brazilian market. The Brazilian market is actually down for the year about 12%. Since we bought this, as you can see, the returns have been um, exceptionally strong. And even for the year, it's been exceptionally strong. And again, it just highlights the difference of what research does in uncovering value and opportunity in the marketplace. So getting the right balance between a research actively managed approach and a passive strategy, uh, we think is critically uh, important. Um, the final area that um, I thought would be, and Eric, um, we thought would be important to uh, touch on is you all are incredibly busy with running your practices and dentistry is what, um, you know, that's your area of expertise. Many times, you know, you don't have as much time to focus on the financial part of your life and creating the right plan. I know there's certainly um, folks on the call that um, have great advisors and are receiving great advice um, and coordinating that advice. And we're, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to work with some of those um, in, in, in your field and resource members and Crown Council members. Um, but understanding how firms are structured, I think are, is incredibly important as well. Um, you know, the two, you know, there's big banks, there's big brokerage firms, and they're compensated by selling products, essentially. Um, and their suitability um, is a little bit less. It's just a suitability requirement in working with their clients. When you're working with a, um, an RIA, Registered Investment Advisor, who works under the 1940 Act, um, the level of suitability is much higher. Um, we are fiduciaries, so One Capital certainly falls in that cat category. Um, and as fiduciaries, the entire decision making of what we do and how we work with our clients always needs to be in the very best interest of our clients. So we don't get um, incentivized to sell individual products. There's a, an advisory fee, which is transparent and that we disclose to our clients. And when you think about it, you know, my personal belief is that's the right way to do this business because ultimately we're only successful if our clients are successful. And I think that's the way it really needs to be. And so you should really understand whoever your advisor is, how they're structured, how they're compensated, and understand and really have a good appreciation if they really do have um, your best interest um, at heart. And I'm sure many of your um, advisors do. Um, I wanted to take a minute, I know Stu touched on it, but just a little bit more background. Uh, on One Capital, um, as Stu indicated, I've been in the financial services business for 30 years. I've worked with some of the larger firms on Wall Street, uh, created my own practice about 10 years ago, and recently merged with One Capital. And the reason I merged with One Capital is because they bring a global presence. So they have a relationship with one of the largest financial institutions in Canada, CI Financial, 
who oversees over $100 billion of assets. But then they also, with that global presence and that deep resource and backing, it's a very boutique, client-centric approach where we really do focus on customizing portfolio strategies uh, to all of our clients. And for any of, uh, any of you who would like to learn more about One Capital, um, we have a great 24-year track record of successfully um, working with our clients. So with that, um, I thought I would end with um, one of my favorite quotes by the illustrious Dr. Seuss, um, who said, sometimes the questions are complicated, but the answers are really quite simple. We're here today and on an ongoing basis to provide you all the answers uh, to whatever questions that you have. So thank you for this time, we appreciate it. We're looking forward to uh, this being the first part of a five, uh, you know, five part series of education and things that we believe and topics that will really help you as you think about your financial situation and how to manage your assets on an ongoing basis. And then let me just turn it over to Eric because we have something that we've structured uh, for resource members that we think will be um, incredibly uh, beneficial. So in the spirit of the Dr. Seuss quote, keeping it simple, as a fiduciary, one thing that Gary made clear is he wanted to add a lot of value to the council. And so the way that we can do that is we're going to offer a free financial assessment to anybody that wants any opinion on what they have going on. And again, being a fiduciary, we'll tell you good, bad, or indifferent what we see. Uh, if we see something being missed, if we see something that looks fantastic, it doesn't matter if it's on insurance, investments, your overall tax strategy, whatever it may be, if it's in your financial wheelhouse, um, that free financial assessment, uh, we will do as a one-time complimentary service for anybody that's a member of the council. So just reach out. We're, we're going to send a form out in regards to that too, um, but certainly reach out to Spencer, Stu, you know, Gary, myself, um, and keep an eye out for the form. So thank you all for the time, and I believe now we're going to open it for our questions. Yep. If uh, anybody has any questions, um, we're both here and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Uh, yeah, you just got everybody's muted. So just unmute yourself if you've got questions. What an incredible offer. I'll be sure to post all your information, you guys, so they can uh, connect with you. Um, thank you. Very, very generous. So uh, any, any questions from Crown Council? I haven't seen any come through for the chat, but if you've got one, now's your time to speak up. Okay. <laughs> Going once, going twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Spence, do you want to wrap up? Yeah. I guess that really thorough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think so. And I think that um, as we go through the five, as we go through the five different courses through this series, that the questions will start pouring in. And, and today you just, you're kind of uh, learning, getting to know this. And then I think you'll feel more comfortable with it. What a fantastic uh, introduction. So um, Eric and Gary, thanks so much for your time today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next uh, weeks to come. I have a question. Okay, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I actually wanna ask you, what is the difference of these financial advisors that have a natalus that are, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but that have a degree that is like a natalus um, degree, are they better than the rest of them or no? I'm not sure which degree you're referring to offhand. Well, like yeah. they belong to this uh, special um, group of advisors that is on the natalus group. No. So there's, in the world of finance, there's a bunch of different types of groups, oftentimes advisors, will use a lot of kind of interesting ways to promote themselves. And sometimes they're meaningful and sometimes they're not. If you email us what the, what the name of it is, we can tell you uh, what the deal is with it. For example, the letters after my name, CFP is probably the gold standard in financial planning. It's a board certification. You have to have a certain educational background, industry experience. You have to take a 10 hour, two day board exam after a series of exams prior. Um, to be awarded the right to have those marks. But in the financial business, there are no shortage of letters you can get after your name and other accolades. What they actually mean can be up for debate. 
Um, we're glad to, to dig into it. If you send uh, either Spencer, Stuart, or ourselves um, that credential that you're talking about, we can t tell you heads or tails what it is. Okay, okay, I will. Yeah, and Stuart, Spence, if you get that information, whatever information, just forward that to us and then we'll provide you know, our yeah. perspective on what that group or you know, specifically what she what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Jamie and Tom. We just want to thank you guys again for um, putting this on. And uh, we spoke with Teresa yesterday, our financial planner, and she told us what you guys are doing for us. And we are thrilled. Thank we, you so much. We sing your praises. Thank you, Jamie. I look forward to seeing you next week. I look forward to it too. We both do. Thank you. All right, Chip, should we wrap it up? Yep. All right, thanks everybody. I'll uh, end the webinar and we'll see you next week. Thank you Bye -bye. guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks. you. Eric.